Do we want the city of Portland to fluoridate our water? We have to ask three questions. Does it really reduce tooth decay? Is it safe to drink? Will it hurt the environment? Let's start with the third one. Fluoride is a waste product from many industries, especially metal smelting and phosphate fertilizer manufacture. It's the main ingredient in many pesticides and in high concentration is known to harm animals, plants, and humans. Proponents say it's harmless in small concentrations. The question is, how small and harmless to whom? For years, the optimal concentration has been said to be one part per million, but humans only drink 1% of the water that goes through our water system. What does fluoride do to the environment downstream? The background level of fluoride in the Willamette and Columbia rivers is very low, less than 0.1 parts per million, and that's the level native salmon evolved to deal with. Fluoride bioaccumulates in aquatic animals. It builds up throughout an animal's life, in the bones and teeth of vertebrates, and in the exoskeletons of invertebrates, in a process called fluorosis. The same thing happens to mammals, including humans. It's surprising how little environmental research has been done about such a toxic chemical. We know salmonids are more sensitive to fluoride than other fish, and that rainbow trout are flat-out killed by about 3.5 parts per million. But as water gets warmer, fluoride becomes more lethal to trout. Global warming is expected to raise water temperatures in the northwest, so salmonids will become more susceptible to low fluoride concentrations. As water gets softer, fluoride becomes more lethal to trout. Water's in the Pacific Northwest are unusually soft, so salmonids here are particularly susceptible to fluoride. The BC Ministry of Environment combined the data from the two previous experiments and determined a maximum safe level for salmonids in the Northwest to be 0.2 parts per million. A team of NOAA scientists headed by Damkayer and Day did the most extensive real-world study on salmon and fluoride at John Day Dam on the Columbia. An aluminum plant was releasing fluoride into the river. More than half of the salmon were dying because they wouldn't enter the fish ladders. The fluoride level was 0.3 to 0.5 parts per million. When the EPA made the plant reduce their fluoride dumping, the level dropped to 0.1 to 0.2 parts per million. The salmon began to pass through the ladders, and the fish deaths dropped to normal levels, below 5%. Then, Damkayer and Day conducted a controlled experiment with two flumes, giving wild salmon the choice of fluoride or not. They avoided the fluoride at 0.5 parts per million, and many wouldn't go in at all. At 0.2 parts per million, they didn't distinguish. Even though many fish still refused to choose a flume at that level, Damkayer and Day proposed that as a maximum threshold for northwest waters, the same level the B.C. Ministry of Environment suggested. And that's about all we know. Since that study, no follow-up has been done for almost 25 years. Why? Well, largely because fluoride advocates have done such an effective job of portraying opponents as dangerous lunatics who fear and misunderstand science. Scientists who have opposed fluoridation have lost funding, licenses, memberships in professional organizations, and even high-ranking jobs. As a result, we know much less than we should about the effects of fluoridation. We know nothing about the effect of fluoridation on juvenile salmon who eat and grow for months or years in fluoridated waters, and what effect bioaccumulation of fluoride may have on their survival and breeding success. Juvenile salmon eat mostly insects. Web-spinning caddisflies, one of their major food sources, are killed by levels of fluoride as low as 0.2 parts per million. We don't know what effect losing that food source has on salmon survival. So, we know that the safe level is less than 0.2 parts per million. Even at that level, Damkayer and Day still found significant harm. Fluoridation has run at one part per million. Last year, realizing that because of fluoridation, 41% of American adolescents have dental fluorosis, the CDC lowered the recommended dose to 0.7 parts per million. Because of the absence of research, we can't be certain how that will affect salmon migration into the Columbia and Willamette basins. It's important to realize that the substance we're discussing is fluorosilicic acid, an unrefined industrial waste product. It is contaminated with arsenic, mercury, and other carcinogenic heavy metals for which the EPA permissible levels are in fact zero. This is not pharmaceutical grade fluoride, it's literally raw industrial waste. Our river complex is already chemically highly compromised. An enormous amount of work has been done to clean it up, but there's a very long way to go. We've spent millions of dollars to improve salmon habitat with restoration projects like Tryon Creek and Johnson Creek, but with so many obstacles to the success of these endangered species, Adding to the chemical soup a highly reactive toxin in concentrations known to interfere with their migration, plus unknown amounts of other dangerous toxins, seems very unwise. 
Is fluoridation safe for the environment? There isn't enough research to be certain, but there is reason for deep concern about its effects on salmon and other crucial parts of the ecosystem. For answers to the other questions, check out the full version linked in the description. I'll give you a hint. We are blessed with some of the purest municipal drinking water in the world. It's hard to imagine adding unrefined industrial waste to such a magnificent resource. Fluoridation is an outmoded technology, and it makes no sense to adopt it now. Please join me in voting no and get your ballot in by May 21st. For more detailed information, please watch the full version at the link below or at howardjpatterson.com. Thank you very much.